Okay, guys, let's start with a plan for the class, a three-day plan for the class. The most important thing to notice from that that I just wrote there is that Gilles Deleuze, which is a who is the subject of the class, to me the most important philosopher of the 20th century, certainly of the late 20th century, and the one with the most potential to be developed in the 21st century, so there's a lot of philosophers in the 20th century, many very important, but many of them have many of them have already ran their way. They already have been exhausted. I mean, you can still write a few things about them, but they don't they don't offer you like this incredible potential to develop the philosophy the way that Gilles Deleuze does. So if you're going to be betting your careers on something, you know, bet your careers on the thing that has the most potential to be developed, and I'm putting my money on Gilles Deleuze and a few others whom I will mention, such as Michel Foucault and others that I will mention as the class proceeds. And the most important thing to notice about Gilles Deleuze right off the bat is that he was one of the few materialist philosophers in the 20th century. There are, there are others, of course, including followers of Marx, that they have to be materialist, but his materialism is new, is entirely fresh, as I'm going to try to prove to you in this first class. And of course, what that means right away is that a materialist needs to be somebody who believes that there is a world, a material world, that exists independently of our minds. That is the most important thing to notice about this thing. Because once you make that commitment, the commitment to the existence of an autonomous world, then all kinds of philosophical consequences followed, and many of the things that you're going to say are already constrained by that commitment. Remember that in the 20th century, 90% of philosophers, whether continental philosophers like Heidegger and Husserl or the other phenomenologists, whether the postmodern philosophers of the 60th generation like Baudrillard, Lyotard, uh, and, and, and Kristeva, Derrida, most of them did not believe in the mind independence existence, existence of the world. They believed, correctly or incorrectly, and we're going to deal with that in the second class today, that experience, human experience, is structured by concepts, it's structured by language. That is, of course, a, it's a very old position, very prestigious position that goes back to Kant at the end of the 18th century and that was continued particularly by German philosophers throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. But the, the experience has a, a conceptual structure, a linguistic structure, because ultimately concepts boil down to language. That is, that was a 20th century attitude towards it. And once you believe that, then everything becomes conventional, since the relationships between a symbol and that which a symbol stands for are always conventions. If symbols structure experience, then everything one sees out there is a convention, because conventions vary from one society to another, different societies see different things, and therefore there's no way of telling whether there is a world that exists in the end of our minds. Our minds are, in a way, constructing the world using signifiers, using language, using concepts, or something like that. I'm going to get back to a more detailed examination of this in tonight's class, when we get down to human experience. A materialist, on the other hand, cannot possibly assume that. He needs to have a different theory of experience, and he needs to have a different theory of the autonomy of the world. He needs to have a certain respect for material processes. Gilles Deleuze was such a philosopher. So, this being, this being the most important decision that we need to make at the outset, to believe in a world that is autonomous, and of course then for, to believe in ecological processes that are autonomous, to believe in climate processes that are autonomous, we can affect those climate processes by spewing out carbon dioxide like crazy into the atmosphere and changing the, you know, the, the temperature by a few degrees and causing global warming. The, the world is not independent of our actions and it's not independent of the consequences of our actions, but it's not as if we were changing it with our minds. 
It's not as if right now we could all say, well, let's, let's agree that with our minds we're going to reduce the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and all of a sudden that carbon dioxide was going to disappear. We affect the world, and the world affects us. It affects us through hurricanes, it affects us through tornadoes, it affects us through <coughs> epidemics, it affects us in a whole variety of ways. And we affect the world in a whole variety of ways, but many ecological processes, many economic processes, many political processes are too slow for us to have a direct experience of them. For instance, the accumulation of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere had to be established through tests in laboratories and through complex theories about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the dynamics of carbon dioxide in interaction with a bunch of other molecules because we humans, we had not seen that we were polluting the world that way. It was just too slow. It occurred over too many decades and, and, the, and the gases are almost invisible for us to actually see them. So they are beyond phenomenology. They are beyond direct experience. Nevertheless, when you begin believing in a material world that is autonomous, you begin taking responsibility not only for what we do to the world with our ideas, but got responsibility for what we do to the world with our actions. And that is to me a very important political point here. You know, to be responsible about our actions because our actions, not only our words, affect the world. So, what we're going to do today is going to be divided into first class from now to one o'clock. I'm going to talk about Deleuze's materialism. One of the most important things about materialism is this. If you're going to be asserting that clouds and mountains, that birds and flowers, that all of those things outside of our minds have an identity that, that is independent of our words and independent of our thoughts, then how do you explain that identity? The typical way of explaining that identity that goes all the way back to Aristotle is to say, well, that mountain has an essence, an essence of mountainhood. That bird has an essence, an essence of birdhood. That sheep it has an essence, the essence of sheephood. And that essence is what, is what it guarantees its autonomous identity, is what, makes, is, what gives it, is what makes it what it is. Today, nobody believes about, uh, about essences. Essences are entirely transcendental and the kinds of entities that we would not want to believe in. So Deleuze has a big task in front of him. How do you justify that autonomous identity without conjuring up these transcendental entities called essences? And as we will see right now, the answer is complex, but it's relatively simple. For whatever entity you're trying to justify, a mountain, a bird, a flower, a cloud, give the historical, physical, or biological, or chemical process, the process that produced that entity. Clouds are produced by certain meteorological processes. Mountains are produced by certain tectonic processes. Plants and animals are produced by certain evolutionary processes. And as long as you give a process of production of that entity that is historical and that, that, that shows you how that entity was in fact generated 